Wait, we got we got to religion within like three minutes. <laughs> yeah, that was quick. You want to get into not... politics now? What's Hello, everyone. I'm Cami Chaos. And I am Rick Terosi, and we are mildly interesting people, which is why every week we do our best to track down some wildly interesting guests to entertain you. Cami, who's our guest this week? I feel weird introducing our guest because this is <laughs> like I know him and all, but like this is your guest. Do you want to introduce well, yep. the guest? I could. Sure. Yeah. No, if you do want me to tell us the some, intro? tell us some interesting things about our guest. Uh, so, you know, I, I jokingly said we failed on finding a wildly interesting guest this week, but everybody knows I was lying because this could be like a, as I was saying, this could be a 12 part mini series with Mars. You have such a man crush. You're not supposed to say the name of the person yet. I haven't said his full name. It's, That's fair. We're still you good. So, uh, such a man crush on him. Okay. Let's see. Uh, built a robot that he dragged around France uh, <laughs> during the Japanese earthquake. Crowdsourced uh, Geiger counters. For <gasps> I people forgot to about that. Track radioactivity. That was really impressive. S- started a fantastic uh, mobile app development agency that morphed into an even greater agency that then was an acquired. Uh, and now in, in, in addition to trying to figure out a way to bring baseball to Portland, uh, he is that. also saving the earth with outboard motors on boats so we can Wait, talk so about what, any. What? what I'm hearing is that you brought a fancy pants man on the show. I brought who's trying who to save to... the world and make it a better place. He likes to start things. I brought somebody on who likes to. Yeah, start but things. he likes to start things, but he also completes them. He's not one of those people who just that's starts true. things and then tosses them away. That's like true. that's the part I'm impressed with. Full circle on mm-hmm. on some of those projects. So, without further ado. Can I welcome our guest, please? Who do we have? Who do we have? Marcelino Alvarez, welcome to the show. It's nice to have you here. Thank you so much. I am so flattered. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, <laughs> equal main crush vibes every every which way. Uh, yeah, no, it's 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 an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, Mars. Is there anything on your mind right now? Is there like any burning thing that you want to talk to the mildly interesting audience about? To be fair, I don't, I'm not, that sounded bad. I'm not saying that y'all are mildly interesting. I'm saying you're the audience for the mildly interesting show. Mildly interesting. Yes. This is a mildly interesting show. You're the audience. Is there anything on your mind, Mars? Let's talk about Portland. It's been a while. It's been a recurring, it's been a recurring theme. Yeah. Uh, Throughout throughout the years, uh, mm-hmm. from you know, sort of the where is point, Portland on the inflection point of 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 startup ecosystems and culture, and I feel like mm-hmm. we once again find ourselves facing some sort of inflection point or or a cliff. I don't know, <laughs> one of the two. I guess you don't know until you <laughs> pass the inflection point, and you're like, are we going up or are we going down? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe start there. We could pick up yeah. a few things. And- yeah. Um, how I'll I'll start like as a serial entrepreneur at the beginning of a new journey. How is this version of Portland treating you? Could be better, could be worse, but you've done this multiple times in town. Like, what's it feeling like as a founder in Portland right now? Yeah, I mean, it feels eerily familiar, and and I think in in a lot of respects, able to leverage the same connections and relationships that we've had for for, for the you know two decades that I've been here. So I'd say, like on the positive side, like you know, a number of the folks who have backed us and supported us so far, have been people that we have known from from you know the beginning times of of doing startup things, and so I think. Not as certainly <laughs> the, beginning the beginning times of times doing startup things. Of doing startup things. Um, so I, I think it, in a lot of spe- respects feels familiar, I think, locally. I would say at the same mm-hmm. time, um, 
it still feels it, it feels like a lot of the effort that we undertook to like build community and proximity around community and find your colleagues and co-conspirators and people work on things like the things that led to serendipity still have not rebounded from mm. the pre-pandemic or from the pandemic lows, which is to say mm. that, yes, I still go to the same coffee shops and hang out and, and do all the things, but the, oh, you should totally meet this person because we're both at the same coffee shop. Like that's not happening here as, as much as it used to, it feels like. And obviously there's sort of the, the broader backdrop of like, you know, what, what people who aren't in Portland every day are hearing about Portland as well as those who right. are, you know, fed up with the the downtown urban corridor and some of the, the you know, sort of infrastructure challenges that are facing mm -hmm. uh, Portland as well. So, so it feels like familiar, but like bizarro, almost like, you know, the, I don't know. Just, yeah, there's a bizarro Portland. It, it, it's Portland that could have been, but still isn't. Yeah. I, w I want to touch on something that, well, I want to, I want to call back to something that you touched on because you, you called it a startup community. You didn't call it a startup scene, um, but it goes back and forth, right? In Portland, sometimes we have a startup scene. Sometimes we have a startup community. What defines the difference for you between those two phrases? I mean, I think a community can be defined as a group of people who are moving towards similar goals, occasionally interconnected uh, and working towards, you know, uh, maybe a common set of objectives. I think a scene is something that's cool. And I don't think Portland's cool right now. And so, like, I, I don't think there's a scene here. I don't think there's, you know, sort of that, like, momentum that, you know, we saw, like, in... 2010 to 2014 era where every other weekend the New York Times was writing about Portland and you were getting unsolicited uh, inbound requests to like um, you know work with you and you're like wait people from New York and from LA and don't <laughs> want to come up to Portland like, it's just like a small little boutique design firm you know like like that that era doesn't feel like it's there and, and, and I, you know I don't know if if if, if it will feedback to that because i feel like that was also like a moment in time where there was such novelty to the the startup ecosystem where it felt like the potential of what could have been you know sort of this bull market that we were writing in that window like you know, there's there's the backdrop of it. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to get back to a scene i don't know if that necessarily should be the goal per se I want to pick a fight now, if that's pick a okay. Fight. Yeah, not not with me. I'm. I want to like pick a fight between the two of you. Oh. That's the first time I have heard a startup scene described as a good thing. Uh, like you used some very positive words to talk about a startup scene, and normally, hey Rick, how do you feel about a startup scene? I don't. I don't really like the term. Like. The startup scene to me is uh, a scene is something that uh, that attracts an element to to um, to Marissa's earlier point. Like it's exciting, it's attracting people, but it's not it not exactly attracting participants in the community. And I think <clears throat> so often what Mars and I have worked on is creating groups of people who are actually doing something not people who are fans of what's being done but but people who are like actually doing the work or starting things or trying you to guys kind of create both though true i mean true. You, the intent is for things to get done but like there I, I i see people fawn over the two of you which is why i stay indoors most of the time now. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go with one other thing, and then I'm gonna hand the reins over to Rick. Um, mm. Rick and I are hiding. We're very much in hiding. Uh, that backdrop that you have there, Mars, that's not like a Zoom background or something. You're in a building. You're in an office. You're out in the world. I mean, you're in Portland, but you're still out in the world. Tell me what the transition was like for you from like full pandemic. Like, was there ever a full pandemic shutdown for you? Or were you always like, no, I'm still going to the office? 
you know, we had two little ones that we were homeschooling because the pandemic shut down the school. And then towards the end of the pandemic, my wife got pregnant and it was, you know, still, uh, we got pregnant post, um, vaccine, but it was, it was really, it was a really scary time. And so we took it very seriously, very conservatively. And so, yeah, for the, the, you know, pre, pre vaccine era, even post vaccine era, because then, you know, my little one still couldn't be vaccinated yeah. because it was, you know, we had two under five. And so we were just waiting for that. And we had one under five. And it was just, it just felt like, you know, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a hard time. You know, I think we had, you know, a number of friends that were, you know, dual income, no kids and, and work remotely and they lived a very different pandemic and, you know, a number yeah. of, you know, um, folks that were, you know, uh, retired and, you know, could do what, you know, travel and be wherever under the pandemic. And I think if, if you were, you know, if, if, if you were caught in the middle, which I think a lot of us were and, and sort of just, reading it like what it was, a global pandemic with unintended consequences whose long-term health effects are still largely unknown. Um, and you wanted to follow the letter of the law and also not potentially, you know, uh, infect someone who is on either end of that spectrum. Like, yeah, yeah we, we took it seriously. So it was, it was really hard. Um, and the, the transition back into it was, was also, you know, weird because, um, you know, in, in the midst of it, right. Like started a, a, a new startup working on electrification <laughs> of outboard motors, which gets me outdoors check, um, not on a zoom all day long check. <laughs> um, but like also took me like, you know, last February to the Miami international boat show where like, you know, in Florida, there, there never was a pandemic. My friends back there, like, you know, I remember them like really close friends, like, you know, uh, sending me a text for like one of my friend's birthday parties and they're all like indoors at a restaurant wearing like hugging and kissing and they're like it's this person's 40th what are you doing and I'm I'm meeting my 287 tuna sandwich you know and like I'm just like <laughs> like that's what I was doing and it was you know it was just a different world and so to go you know from not doing anything to then suddenly being in a convention center with 180,000 people for whom, you know, a third of them, <laughs> the former guy was still president. Um, you know, it was just, it was just, it was weird. And it was just like a band aid being ripped off. Um, funny enough, uh, I didn't get COVID in Miami, uh, then because I'm like, like blasted through Florida over. Even like subsequent weeks, so it was actually probably the best place to be. I can see it, like in <laughs> Portland, like at the first like conference I went to in Portland, uh, or or like one lunch that I had during that conference week. Exactly, none of my colleagues that went to the conference got it. I went to like one indoor, uh, and people in a room like lunch, and I'm like, well, <laughs> I mean, it's been six months, and you know, like what are the odds? And sure enough, that was that was the one. Um, so so yeah, I you know. And then, and now into this world, which is, you know, like, it's a, it's a weird hybrid because, you know, I've got the, the two kids are in school, the, the oldest are in school and, and, you know, they're getting, their immune systems are getting destroyed by like everything else <laughs> that, right. that, that they have not had, you know, and so RSV and flu and flu and RSV and sniffly things. And then our mm -hmm. one year old is, you know, then catching that downwind. And so it feels like, Sniffly nose for about maybe six months or some variation of, of, of that. And I haven't been on wood sick in that, that same period of time. Well, because, you have all of those sniffles. <laughs> because I've had all those things, right? So like, yeah. and so the world now is like them getting acclimated to that norm. Uh, the risk's still there, right? Like COVID hasn't yeah. gone away. Uh, mm -hmm. it's still there. People are still dying. Like we still have like a, you know, a nine eleven's worth of people dying in this country, like every week. And yeah. we haven't really like, you know, reckoned with that. So that part's weird. Um, but then, you know, if I fly and I, I've been flying, right. Like I wear a mask when I fly, um, except for when they bring my food and then, you know, I wait for everyone else to eat. And then for a moment, I like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, mm. I don't know. Wait, so, yeah. may I make a suggestion? Yes. Yeah. Get a problem. diet, get a dietary issue, and then they bring you your food first, and then you get to eat while they give everyone else the food, and then mask back up. Just, just saying. 
but then you have to like be gluten free or something. So that's it's not. I mean, then, then you're eating the stale crackers. I, you know, I, it's <laughs> polenta, polenta, <laughs> polenta, steamed polenta with uh, pasta. Um, it's, it's yeah, so it's weird, right? Like, and and you know, and then you still you know interact with people that like you know won't won't shake hands, but we're we'll eat we're together and they're like. But it's mm-hmm. airborne, you know, and so and, and again, and, and so much of this, I think, is a combination of like what makes people at this point feel all right about themselves and their own risk profile, whether or not it's rooted in what's actually likely to happen. On the good news side, we have the medications to like you know mm-hmm. treat a lot of it. So as long as you're, a, I don't know. And, and even at this point, like vaccination doesn't matter, although it's good to get vaccinated, um, you know, like. Yeah, it feels like we're at a different spectrum, and I and I don't know what the answer is, and I don't know what, like what reverting back to like what was looks like if it were to get worse. It's stable, so I don't know. So still worried about all the risks. Yeah, and I was just like they calculated calculated risks, um, but yeah, I'm indoors. But like, what's funny is like I see fewer people now, and I I see fewer people now indoors <laughs> in, in the office than I'm in than if I were at home. Um, so probably. <laughs> Um, I, you touched on Florida and, and talking about kids. I just wanted to, like, one of the things we like to do is just kind of take people back to when they were younger. You're a kid in Florida. You have always impressed me as not only a problem solver, but someone who is not afraid to tackle incredibly difficult and complex problems, be it getting a robot into France or figuring out and, and, you know, and a new form of outboard motor. What, what inspired little Mars? Take us back to little Mars in Florida. Like where, where does the inspiration come? Like, is there a single moment? Is there a series of moments where you kind of discover this passion or this desire to express your creativity by solving complex problems? Like, where do you think that came from? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Rick. I don't think I've ever been asked this question. (laughs) So I feel like I have to like, both go back in time and think about me in Florida, including the part that I've blocked out from my memories mm-hmm. to figure out where it all came from. You know, I will, I will say that like, as a kid, I was always a tinkerer. Um, if, you know, with, with toys, something, Hey, I took care of my toys. I'll start there. Uh, I took care of all my things. I was the person mm-hmm. who was obsessed with, uh, both using the toys, but also like making sure that they were like, Cared for, and it's it's a reason like why my kids today have like a, a Tupperware container full of like you know, old GI Joes and like Muscle Men and, and yeah, you know other other things that like have, have lasted through the years. And even though they got tons of use, like they were always you know cared for. So I think there's part of I would say maybe the conservation story starts with sort of this like look after the things that that you use. Um, and I would say that like. <clears throat> You know, growing up, we spent, you know, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, spent summers in the Florida Keys, and, and uh, a lot of the principles of conservation were pretty apolitical back then, like just thinking through like how we respected our oceans and, and how we treated things. And a lot of that, you know, leave it better than you found it sort of um, mm-hmm. philosophy, throw back the smaller fish today, so they can be bigger fish tomorrow, you know, don't step on the coral reef, like, like uh, just, just respect the things that you're interacting with so that future generations might, might preserve it was a pretty apolitical, I would say, like lowercase, you know, C conservative, you know, point of view is conservationist, right? Like you were, you were conserving. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I grew up in a, in a pretty conservative household, but like it was environmentally friendly in that respect. I remember like not eating tuna for like a year because of, you know, the, <laughs> the sun kissed bumblebee, bumblebee tuna and then sort of the sarcus tuna and then the whole one. So I think that those, those aspects, um, I think are part of it. Um, I think. The creativity side, you know, I think came from both my, my dad and my mom. You know, my dad, you know, was, was a physician, but uh, ultimate uh, tinker and builder of things as well. And, you know, had, you know, probably like the first Dremel and was just like, you know, making like random things out of plexiglass and wood and always like building things. And 
And I think, you know, my, my, my mom, like just kind of like growing up was always like into like, like finding things for like us to do as like kids and just kind of like keeping us like entertained, and, like getting out the other. So like, there's just like a mix of sort of like humble curiosity and mixed with, um, with just taking care of the world around us. I don't know if there was like a, a single moment where, you know, uh, there was sort of like the spark around things. I, I will say some funny things in, in hindsight. Um, I remember um, my, so we were in South Florida and there was a big, uh, one of the events that they ran uh, was this thing called Silver Night. And so it was like in each high school, they would nominate. I don't know if this is outside of, I think it might only be Florida specific. It was like, they would nominate you for like a category, right? And so there was like math and science and athletic, whatever, specific things. And we, you know, went to high school, had a lot of just really smart, brilliant kids. And so I was, I was always a generalist. I was never the best in science, never the best in math. So those kind of been running for, you know, various things, but, they were much better, more qualified people for me for any of those categories. But they're like, oh, we got to nominate him for something. And so they nominated me for entrepreneurship, um, which at the time I had a very difficult time saying. And also, like, <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't done it very well. It's like, I haven't started a company. I haven't done anything. Like, and and um, I turned down the nomination and, and, yeah. and, and I turned it down. And I and respectfully, I, I said, listen, I, I appreciate this. I understand why you made the decision for this person. You know, she's way better for me than math. And this person, you know, he's way better than me uh, in like social science, like all this stuff. And I was like, I'm not qualified for this. And I'm not going to win it. And I don't want to go through the effort of applying for this thing that I'm not going to get. <laughs> and I heard you think here, <laughs> fast forward 20 years later, it's like, yeah, that the, whoever nominated me was right. Like they were totally right. I, and, and I, and I was, I mean, I, I don't think it would have won, but like, um, they definitely saw, I think in me that, that entrepreneurship, uh, aspect, I think somehow, and I don't know where it came through or they were just like, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. yeah, sure. Throw them in for entrepreneurship. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, do you I think I, do you think they saw it, or do you think that like you were like, God damn it, I'm going to prove them right? Like, it's no, just no, such it a wasn't that it wasn't that okay. it, it wasn't it, it wasn't like stuck with like oh I need to prove them prove them right on this thing you know it, it yeah it was just a time I was like eh, you know that seems weird but I would say like in college I think it's probably where like the the evolution of that like dot com era, like all these like ideas coming through. And like I remember like between college and like my first few years out of college, just having like constant product ideas, like the one. And constantly being told like that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And like <laughs> and just and just like the and that's probably like the response to that, I think probably was more of an impetus for doing things because the list, the list is ridiculous. Like after my freshman year of college, I was doing a summer semester at the University of Florida, and I was just a, just a, appalled by the price of books. And I was like, you know, it'd be great if we had a database where we could just buy, put in our courses and just buy books and get cheapest books shipped to us, like from <laughs> all over the world, including, you know, things that are coming off of app.com and the local bookstore. And I remember I had like four or five friends who were like, this is dumb. We don't want to be known for like selling books and i'm like i don't know i think there's a thing here i think there's a thing here and like i remember we went to like it wasn't you know my school but it was just university of florida i'm like you have a database with all the books and they're like yes and i'm like and i didn't know how to program or do anything you know oh, i did not program. i didn't know how to do anything with sql i didn't know like because they they just they printed out <laughs> the database of all their books they handed me the entire like course catalog <laughs> the entire university of florida and it was like two thousand pages and i'm like i don't know how i'm going to what do we do with this? Um, and then I remember, you know, big ideas. I'm like, here's hard drives. And then there's like, you know, in car systems, what if we tried to like build a hard drive that goes where your CD player and trying to like get mm -hmm. some of the engineering students to kind of, they're like, what are you trying to do? I'm like trying to get like an MP3 player, but that goes in your car. Like, why wouldn't we take the MP3, you know? And so people have been like, dude, you're dumb. So like, <laughs> I, I think I was you're like, so dumb. That was that's a horrible idea. There's no way that's going to happen. Between Bezos and Jobs, like I could have been them all. Um, and I think honestly, and I think making a note to listen to Mars's dumb ideas. You know, invest in electric outboard motors. This is not a solicitation, by the way. Um, the uh, the I would say that so many times it was just like an idea that was too early, and because back then I didn't 
um, I didn't know how to build a team the right way. I think I just looked for the people that were around me and the people that were around me were people that I had either gone to school with or was randomly assigned to be neighbors like in my college dormitory. And so that wasn't the way to build a team um, unless unless you were you know a few, a few hundred miles north and, and Cambridge and do the same thing. But broadly, not the way to, to, to build the team. And so I think what came out of that was like, there has to be a better way to like find people to like do these crazy ideas and these things that you have and like kind of, you know, go, go after them. And I, and I think, I think the constant, like, I had a notebook with that thing in there. And now look at this guy. Uh, he's, he's, he's the richest man in the world uh, or was richest man, you know, like that sort of stuff is done. And again, execution is everything. And just because I had an idea of a notebook of a stupid thing, doesn't mean that I would have ever executed the thing. I clearly didn't execute the thing. But it was just constantly just having like ideas for things and just being frustrated that like someone else got to it. And honestly, like I would say that like that feeling probably carried through all the way to like Safecast. And Safecast was probably mm-hmm. like the first real thing where we just did it. And we said, we have an idea. Let's just go make this thing and release it into the world. Um, you know, the kickball and some of the, the, the earlier apps are for close to that build up. There were a few other things that I like, came before, but like that era, I think was probably where we were closer to just saying, here's an idea. I've got a good design resource. I've got a good engineer. Let's just go build it, see what happens and put it out into the world. And it wasn't until then that like, and, and even just going into the unfortunate era of just like having a team of people who were infinitely more capable than me of actually like making a thing you know a crazy idea into something that like could be made really came to be and and now with photon i would say this is the first time where rather than trying to do it while running a consultancy or rather than trying to do it as a side project mm-hmm. i just said i just need to do it and part of it is a combination of both the sense of urgency but also probably just seeing that feeling of like, you know, 19 year old me being frustrated because I had an idea for an online bookstore and just no one do it. And just knowing that someone is going to do it. Uh, I don't want to be wrong. About this. And so I think, I think it has all led up to this, but yeah, it's just always a, a combination of things and just kind of watching kind of this plus this do something better over, over here. I think probably I've always looked at the world. Yeah. It also, strikes... growing up in Florida is really weird. Growing up in Florida is really weird. We'll talk about that part. But growing up in Florida is really, really weird. Everything can kill you. I we can get there. That. True. We can get there. Yes. Good. We can, you know what? We should talk about. It's like, it's like Australia. Florida or Texas. Is, is our Australia. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you get from, I'm just going to grab the people around me and we'll see what happens to, it, it strikes me that you are one of the people I know who is most capable of building an amazing team uh, to follow through with your vision. How did you get there? How did you learn to do that? That's not something that they're like, that's not that there's not a class. There's not like, there's a, yeah, you can't like major in finding people to do the right things in college. How did you get there? Um, Just learn, learn skills and, and working alongside some really talented people. I think when, when, you know, I, Worked with uh, Porter Bogusky down in Miami. There are just a ton of really amazing uh, designers and technical resources. And they were in house technical resources and they were UX resources and house programmers and just working alongside design and engineering teams in a very highly creative environment. I think um, it just exposed me to, I think, both the personality types that you see in such an organization, but also like, oh, this person's enjoyable to work with. This person is not enjoyable to work with. <laughs> uh, when I came out to, to widen infinity to, to, to you know, take a pass at bringing some of that in-house expertise, it was like, well, part of my job was like, who did I recruit to Portland that can be part of this? And, and you know, widen secret sauce is always like, you know, a third from your backyard, a third from the um, the city that you're, you know, yeah, a third from the network and a third, you know, like new people coming in. That's sort of like the recipe for um, new office expansion. So I was at least able to, you know, get a few folks from, uh, from either Boulder, Miami to come out to Portland for a bit of time to, to be part of the mix. And it was people that I already knew uh, to work with and so you could kind of de-risk the, the challenges. And I think part of it is just creating a, a compelling vision, like, hey, here's what we're trying to do, but for this. Here's what we're trying to do, but for that. 
Um, and I think, you know, advertising is it's one industry, but when I started and worked, it was, hey, it's like advertising, but now we're building things that hopefully will last a little bit longer. And then we're like, mm-hmm. oh, well, now you're stuck to the upgrade cycle of the phone, which is every year. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe not that much longer. Um, but a similar sort of pitch, which is like, you know, I think as as a as a coworker, as a as a boss, as a colleague, I try to be both humble and 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 acknowledge that I don't know everything. You know, acknowledge that I make mistakes, that I'm human, uh, and be transparent about where we are and where we aren't. And I would say that I've probably made more friends than enemies in in the world just running that way. I know it's a handful of people that hate me. Uh, that's okay. Um, but but generally, I to to leave. You know, again, it's that that conservation approach, like. Leave, leave things better than I found it. And like, you know, yeah. the reason I'm able to rent a desk from my former employer right now uh, <laughs> is is because I didn't, you know, fortune on the way out. Um, and, and, Not a bridge and, burner. And, well, Portland A has only very few bridges. Most of them aren't earthquake proof. And so if I burn the bridge <laughs> or knock true. it down with an earthquake, like you will not have a way to get back across the other side it's of the true. river when the big one comes. And the big one might be a metaphor or it might be a big one. Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask a stupid question now. Stupid question. And then I'm going to hand it back over to Rick for some smart things. But you've mentioned tuna sandwiches twice in already <laughs> in this conversation. And so I really want to talk about that. Uh, the first time I was, the first time I was like, I want to know about Mars's perfect tuna sandwich. The second time I was like, this is permission to ask, yeah. obviously, if he's mentioning it again. So talk to me about a tuna fish sandwich. Uh, yeah. Why is it why is it amazing and what are the right ratios of tuna to other things? What is the fat that you use in your tuna sandwich? I, I want to talk about a tuna sandwich right now. I don't I can't read Rick's face. I can't tell if this is like amazed approval or <laughs> Jesus Christ, I wish you'd stop talking, but Yeah, let's do it. Let's do a tuna sandwich. Um talk to tuna, me. The tuna the tuna sandwich starts with uh albacore tuna. So make sure yes. you get you get the, the albacore, not not mm-hmm. not the dark meat on it. Um and uh lime juice. Uh oh. lemon juice as a starting point uh for it. Allow it to soak into uh the meat of the tuna. Uh so you know, take it up from the can, spread it so with the fork so that the lime juice can soak into it. You don't want it just on the top of the bottom. Um I like adding um, you know, sufficient mayonnaise to kind of get things going a little bit of like Jacobson sea salt, some freshly ground pepper. Uh, and then there's like a combination of things that can like go into it. I love fresh dill. You got some fresh dill, throw some fresh dill into your tuna. Rick, really? tell him what I planted today. You plant some dill. That's good. That's great. Fresh That's great. Dill. Yeah. Yeah. Big dill. Uh, and then <laughs> I like adding, um, <laughs> slices of cherry tomatoes because they're both kind of mm. similar in terms of sort of the thing so it's either apples or tomatoes um i enjoy adding uh taking some of the um bubba's uh pickles mm-hmm. slicing bubby them. the bubby bubba? bubba's, yeah, bubbies. bubbies okay bubbies, I'm, bubbies pickles grandma yeah, i'm grandma, bubbies. with you on the bubbies 100 percent. make your okay. own relish make your own relish um mm-hmm. some uh stone ground mustard uh in there as well um and then you need something that's sort of like on the onion spectrum. And on the onion spectrum, you can either do a, you know, some thin red onion slices, uh, or some capers, uh, capers also have a nice mix. Mm. Mix. Um, I like tuna melt. Um, that was so, my next question. Sorry, that was loud. That was my next question. Where do you stand on the tuna melt? Tuna melt. I like cheddar cheese and mm-hmm. cheddar cheese cold mm-hmm. on a tuna salad sandwich cold is just meh. So, uh, open faced. That way, the melt you get double the cheese melting mm-hmm. on either side, and you can use white bread or pita as an alternative. Mm, fantastic! Face. Is this why there's the wine bar that I know we both enjoy? Have you had their tuna melt? Um, their tuna melt is among the best in Portland. It huh. really is. It, is. it really is fantastic. It really is. Even it's on good. gluten, even on gluten free bread, it's yeah, it's good. It's good. That wine bar also had a really good um, chorizo and shrimp sort of like dish that came with the baguette and they got rid of it. And it's really a bummer mm. because when not getting tuna. Yeah. 
Um, I, I did have that. I had the honor of eating that before they took it off their menu and it was, yeah. It was good because it had like those tapas that you could just kind of sit there and like soak yeah. up that garlic, chorizo, olive oil with shrimp. It was delicious. I'm hungry. Yeah, me too. Rick, you can now ask him questions that are not about what, food. What time zone? What time yeah. zone are you in? You're you're yeah. in a different time zone. Yeah. Is it breakfast? Is it dinner? No, uh, I'm a, I'm I'm home. No, no, but what time zone is your stomach in? Yeah. Oh, my stomach, my stomach. I, I'll be honest. We're having fish and chips for dinner tonight. My my time zone is in whatever time zone the fish and chips are when they arrive. So it's in Ted Lasso time zone because it's really good fish and chips, but. So clearly we need to have Merce back already know that we know this is a multiple yeah. part thing. So I'm really struggling for the next question. But if you want me to ask I, a dumb question, I can. No, this is one that I really want to get into this first conversation just because, um, some of the themes we've discussed and, and touching on Florida and uh, solving difficult problems and those kind of things. And to people outside the U S this might not sound like a terribly difficult problem to solve, but Mars, I would just love to hear you talk a few minutes about why entrepreneurship in Cuba and why go through the mm. political intrigue to make that happen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just by, by way of background, um, even, uh, and in 2015 and 2016, I had the pleasure of, of, of working with uh, one of the most amazing human beings I've ever encountered uh, in my life, this guy, Mickey Johnson, who started a program at the Western Institute in partnership with the Richardson Center for Global Engagement, focused on connecting People on the U.S. side, uh, academics, creatives, business leaders with their counterparts in countries that were on the cusp of, of dramatic change. And he would go to places like Myanmar, Lebanon, Colombia, Cuba. So the, the thinking was that as relationships get better, you've got a foundation to business relationship. So it's not people out. And he's also one of the most humble people in the world. But there's not a single, you know, a notable American that uh, the last few years has been stuck abroad, but like Mickey hasn't, uh, you know, his, his hands in, in bringing them back to the U.S. Like he is a remarkable, like next level human being um, who is also so humble about all the things. And so um, a friend of a friend had, uh, uh, a friend introduced me to him and had come back and said, hey, I just got back from this trip and I'd love to be able to do some design thinking work back in Cuba interested in, in being part of this program and moving on you know, felt like a, a boondoggle and sort of like a once in a life what is real uh, and about 30 days before like actually shipping out to Havana I was like no we need to transport info so that the visa and like oh this is real uh, so, <laughs> so we went went down there and, and had an opportunity to uh, meet entrepreneurs who are solving real problems in their neighborhood through the, the most, you know, technologically and politically constrained environments. You know, they were building a, a Yelp-like product with, you know, unreliable mobile service, no official mobile service, right? Everything's sort of on Wi-Fi. They were restaurateurs that were, you know, husband, wife team who had worked professionally for, you know, 40 years before retiring into a life of opening up an Indian restaurant and a sort of like a cheesecake factory for Cuban food type restaurant, everything your grandma would serve. Uh, type of a, of a place without any sort of wholesale restaurant, and you know the opportunity was was really life changing for me, and and also to have an opportunity to to meet you know family members that you know, so growing up in Florida, you're 90 miles from Cuba. I don't think you appreciate how close that is. It's it's the Portland to Seattle puddle jumper, right? And and yeah. and. and they don't, I mean, it's even less than that. You don't have enough time to get like the meal service between the two. So it's just like, you're up and now you're down. And for, you know, my entire childhood is just like sort of portrayed as this other, this really kind of dark other of, of you know, communism in Cuba and those that stayed behind or those that couldn't get out. And it, it's very complicated in South Florida and it's exploited um, by the right to capture the, you know, open Cuban vote. But, you know, I think where, yeah, and it was hard in my family, right? Because like my, my dad was kind of like, 
almost open to coming to Cuba and then, you know, couldn't, couldn't bring himself to do it. Just I think, you know, combination of my grandmother's, you know, sort of like wish of like, Hey, don't go back because I don't know if you'll be able to get out. Um, yeah, just sort of the, the, the way that that, um, just pulls apart. And, and, you know, the hard part for me was, you know, I got to sit in the living room of my father's childhood home with my grandma's oldest and my grandma's youngest cousin and, and break bread and have dinner and, you know, share a box of photos and, and see, you know, sort of the, the generational divisiveness that, you know, the failed policy on both the U.S. side and the Cuban side have caused on, on families. And, and the second time that I got to go, I, you know, called my grandma from, or they called us from, you know, from, from the States and I got to, you know, be listening to like a landline, you know, phone while her cousin was talking to her and they're sort of like, you know, who would have thought, right? Like, imagine here, I'm sitting here with your with your grandson, and he looks exactly like what I would what your expect your son to look like. And I never had a chance to see them, and you know, it was heartbreaking. And and you know, I really tried to get my dad to go on that trip, and and he wouldn't. And I think, you know, that was 2016 was the the last time I went down there. And and you know, my grandma's oldest cousin passed away a year later. And my grandma passed last last year, and so there is no going back and then there's no way of seeing that. And you think about that's just one, you know, sort of connection. You multiply that times the, the hundreds of thousands of Cubans that have that sort of diaspora between those that could have and those that didn't and the complexity between the two. And I think for me, it was important being part of that conversation. The way I rationalized it with my dad is like, if not me who has the context of how complex this is and, and, and how nuanced this is you're gonna get some random person from cincinnati ohio who's trying to like start a business down there with you know and is yelling loudly at the next table about you know what 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 you know how much money they're gonna make on this thing versus like yeah. this is complicated and it's not as easy as the u.s is this or the the given government is that and and um it's not as it's not as black and white it, it's it's really complicated and nuanced and i would say that broadly uh, if it's one thing that the last few years have indicated here in the United States is that the idea of nuance in our political discourse uh, is just not something that appears. And so, you know, the, if, if, if you really wanted to like end the Cuban, you know, regime uh, overnight, you would just drop the embargo. It would just, yeah. it would, it, and just allow capital to flow. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and you can't get that sort of political will. Uh, you know, certainly, Certainly not in a you know Republican led uh, uh, you know U.S. government, uh, and, and and tragically, you know it's not something that Biden has picked up you know post Trump. But, and I don't know if it's because there's other priorities or uh, he thinks that Florida will ever go blue again. It's it's not for a while, um, and so it's it's a bummer um, because you know you can't get back on there as, as easily as you once could, and then. You know, it, it felt like in the you know subsequent times leading up to it that like you, you you could see the the emotions changing and sort of optimism, and then as you know, sort of the Trump thing, you know, sort of like is this a thing? We're like, no, 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 you're good, you're good. He's not going to win. So like, oh shit, this is a thing. Um, <laughs> that happened. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, it's, and it might happen again. We haven't done. Mm -hmm. You heard it. You heard it here first. Uh, no, it again. No, um. <laughs> that's that's the next episode with you. <laughs> I'm gonna call it sick that day. Yeah. Politics. So anyway, so yeah. So put a finer point on it. Yeah. Call it sick on that. Put a finer. I mean, I think for me, Cuba was a way to connect my personal past with my professional present, looking towards an indeterminate future. And I think that the future that came out of it, unfortunately, was not what any of us had anticipated. And I think part of it was the macro picture changed so dramatically. If we had continued on that course, the embargo might be gone. It might have been lifted and we might have a much different story where there is stronger, you know, between you know, Cuba and uh, the United States and South Florida and in really interesting ways. But it didn't happen. It could have, but it didn't. I have, Thank you. I have two things. One, I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah. Um, is Mickey still doing two? Is Mickey still doing those trips? I know it's a lot more difficult to travel there right now, but is he still organizing those? He's not doing anything with uh, with Cuba. I know that um, he was involved with some of the, the more recent high profile um, 
get American citizens back home that have been in the news recently. Uh, mm-hmm. And I won't say the names. I forget where on the level of disclosure he is with some of those. But I would yep. I would generally yep. say that if he's been in, if if you've seen an American getting brought home, it's Mickey's usually somewhere involved in mm-hmm. it. Um, and thank you, Mickey. Yeah, thank you, Mickey. Um, yeah. So. Um, so he, I, don't, I don't think he's doing that as much, uh, but he's, yeah, he's doing some really interesting programmatic stuff in, in other places. And this, yeah, just, just an awesome human being to know. Cammy, out of respect for Mars's time, since we'll obviously have him back. I don't want let, to ask him the questions because then he'll go away. I know, but that's how this works. He's always, he will, he'll be back. It'll be fine. You love the I, lightning round. I love it's my favorite part. How about this? Before we ask the lightning round, I have a question. I'm really Marps. If you were to be the senior correspondent for something on mildly interesting people, what would you be the senior correspondent for? Oh, that's amazing. Um, I would be the senior correspondent for mildly interesting um, karaoke bars. Uh, all across the country oh. mm. and i would See? report from the most mildly interesting karaoke establishments uh, across the country uh, <laughs> so if i were to offer you that position right now would you accept it i think i have shareholders uh and investors who would probably be angry if i cannot accept <laughs> cannot. we're pivoting we're pivoting into reporting from <laughs> Diving. Karaoke bars. Karaoke bars. Um, no, I wouldn't accept it. But I thought it was the honorary course, oh. senior correspondent. Yes, honorary. You could be the honorary. You could be honorary. Mm-hmm. I would I would at least give you an opinion on karaoke bars. How's that? You could be the I you accept. could be the yeah. senior you could be the senior journalist correspondent. We could just pull you in on random occasions. Oh, I like that. Mm-hmm. So we'll have a futurist and now a generalist. Okay. And and a mathematician. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, it's time for the mildly interesting question. Lightning round. You ready? I'm ready. All right. Uh, question number one. What is your favorite but least useful hobby? Favorite but least useful hobby uh, mm-hmm. would be just fishing. I like being on the boat. Mm-hmm. It's not useful. It doesn't serve anything. It doesn't serve any purpose. But being on the water, it's not catching a fish or catching a fish. Nice. Still better than not being on the water. Uh, question number two, would you like to survive the zombie apocalypse? Yes. I'm ready for it. Yes. Uh, we will have a follow-up conversation off camera later at some other point. Uh, question number three, what is the last food that you photographed? The last, can I, can I check my phone? Yeah, yes, of course. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. I wasn't, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what the. Oh yes. The protocol is look at the phone. Look at the phone. Oh boy. Oh, right. It's been a while since I photographed food. I'm disappointed. I know. Um, I think part of it is, and we talked about this sort of at the upfront. Um, this is, uh, I'll stop saying a lot of things. So I won't share the photos uh, for, for privacy reasons, but uh, it was my uh, son's one, uh, one first birthday uh, where I took oh. a photo of the. Uh, uh, that he was eating nice. that he smashed cake and he refused to eat because he doesn't <laughs> like sugary things for some reason. So he pushed it away and we're like, whose <laughs> kid are you? <laughs> Sugar here. <laughs> How dare you? The rebellion, it starts early. The rebellion mm-hmm. starts at one. Yeah, sooner. All right. Uh, what is the best season? Summer. Oof. Mm. Wow. I'm from, I'm from Florida. I, want, I know you are. I want, I, I want 12 hours of daylight. I want those birds screaming at 4 45 in the morning. And I want, mm-hmm. we are coming, we are coming into your season. It is, it is a happy place for me. All right. Last but not least, magnets or stickers? Magnets. Hmm. Huh. Can you give me some information behind why you've chosen magnets? I'm curious. Stickers aren't reusable. Back to the conservation. All right. <laughs> it's valid. That's yeah, a, no. That's the There's no, that, there are no that's wrong the answers only. here. It's a sometimes, safe Sometimes sometimes Magnus is the wrong answer. Uh but I do not find it to be the wrong answer in this case. I accept conservation and science. Rick, 
Would you like to yes. wrap the show up knowing that we're going to invite Marsh to be back on in a couple of months? Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. I was uh, super excited for this conversation, not only because I, I settled down. not only I was because, giggling uh, because he was so excited. He's so excited to have you on the show. I was so I was so nervous. I was like, Rick and I have talked uh, about a lot of things, but what if Rick I don't knows have a an lot. answer? To, he knows a lot. What if I don't have an answer to the question? And then you were the curveball. I had no idea where you were going to go with it. So I'm glad we you, got to talk about tuna sandwiches. Yeah, you're yeah. never going to have any idea where I go with anything. That's the yeah. charm of Cam and Chaos. That's, um, yeah, Rick, go. Yeah. Well, it's do you your know, magic. I'm trying. So. Uh, I was super excited about this. I was like, oh, we're going to get to have Mars on. Uh, Cami was super excited about it. Apparently, Mars was nervous, which I never think of Mars as nervous. But I just, Mars, love you dearly. You're such a genuine and amazing human being. And I feel like we have had the opportunity to not only collaborate, but, but also separate and cross paths in new and different and interesting ways that always makes it an absolute joy to get the chance to catch up with you again and to figure out where you are and what's going on and how things are going. And it's uh, our absolute pleasure to, to get the chance to share you and your insights with people who may not have had the chance to meet you yet. Um, and I encourage them to take the opportunity to connect with you. So thank you very much for taking the time. We're definitely having you back. There's so much more to talk about, uh, but uh, we really appreciate having you here and thanks for making the time. Really grateful. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is a blast and yeah, happy to come on whenever you, whenever you want me to. Thank you so much, Mars.